All right, we're ready to rock and roll. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for participating in today's discussion, uh, the second virtual uh, ultrasound lecture series. So hopefully we can continue this on um, once we even get back into real time and just kind of expand the opportunity to, to have us all kind of meet together, even if you can't make it in the hospital. But for now, we're going to do it uh, with our social distancing. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, we're going to talk about cardiac ultrasound today uh, in the context of COVID-19. Um, you know, and while we're not seeing a huge surge right now um, for, for COVID patients like we were expecting, which is great um, in one sense, um, you know, for the sake of Cleveland, uh, I think today's discussion still is going to have value for a couple of reasons. Number one, if that surge happens, right, um, we can you know, be prepared. Or number two, you know, what we're talking about isn't necessarily something that you only see in COVID-19. So there's going to be broad applicability um, even beyond this particular pandemic um, for future viral outbreaks for, you know, for one, but for, for other, um, you know, things as well. So uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Instead of me just kind of yammering on um, for a period of time on a particular topic, I've actually invited two guest experts to join me today uh, to discuss this topic. So joining me today is Dr. Ashish Anisha, uh, one of our cardiologists um, who's taken time away from reading Echoes today uh, to spend time with us um, talking about cardiac point of care ultrasound. Um, Ashish and I have talked you know, about bringing cardiac ultrasound to the bedside um, and in how to enhance our clinical experience uh, in this capacity. So I'm excited to have Ashish here. Um, also with us is Dr. Ziad Shaman from the MICU. Um, we all know Z. Um, he's been a huge partner for me as well as for us in the ED uh, in doing and teaching critical care ultrasound. Uh, so thank you both for being here uh, and participating in our, our discussion. Um, so right out of the gate, um, I kind of want to set the scope of this topic or this talk, right? There's going to be a, t there's a ton of different directions that we can take cardiac ultrasound. Um, there's, there's a lot of minutia we can get into uh, with kind of how we want to how we want to discuss this. Um, but I, I want to focus our discussion here today um, so that we can make this super practical. Um, you know, for those of us who are kind of at the front lines, whether it be in the ED or in critical care environments, um, you know, those of us who have some experience with point of care ultrasound and kind of give us a tool uh, to help guide kind of our differential making and kind of tailor our, our treatment, right? Um, so hopefully this is helpful. The talk is going to presume a baseline level knowledge of, of cardiac ultrasound. So if you need kind of a refresher, uh, we can kind of talk about that at some other time. But we're going to talk, you know, assume kind of that baseline ED level of, of, um, of knowledge for, for cardiac ultrasound. Uh, so as we get started, let's st set the stage with kind of a hypothetical patient. Um, and, and this one's completely made up, right? There is no grounding in reality to this patient, but it's something that's plausible that could be seen um, in our department or something that could be admitted upstairs. Uh, so imagine you're seeing a 55-year-old female uh, presents uh, to the ED uh, with chest pain and dyspnea. That's the chief complaint, right? Shortness of breath and chest pain. Uh, vitals are not great, a little tachycardic, a little hypotensive. Um, Tachypnic sats are kind of 93-ish. Um, you know, so it's a new oxygen requirement for this person. Uh, and they're febrile, right? So this could be anybody. It could be anything. Uh, in an era of COVID, that's going to be certainly a, a big concern for us. Um, past medical history is significant only for hypertension, right? So there's no pre-existing coronary disease, no pre-existing, um, you know, cardiomyopathies. There's no pre-existing lung disease. Um, they are otherwise healthy, right? Um, only on lisinopril for blood pressure support. Uh, and apparently, given its blood pressure, it's working really, really well. Um, from an exam standpoint, right, this is to be kind of what we're, what we'd really expect to see, kind of a mildly ill appearing, not like super sec, you know, septic toxic appearing, but mildly ill appearing, um, some JVD in the neck, um, heart is tachycardic, otherwise regular rate and rhythm, nothing really to write home there, uh, respiratory kind of, well, I guess clear to auscultation bilaterally and diffuse rowels are mutually exclusive, um, which this, I guess, simulates a, an actual note where we just drop a dot phrase in. Um, but you know, basically clear or, or lung sounds throughout, but, but rowels kind of throughout as well. Um, so nothing particularly focal, but definitely you can, it sounds wet. And on the extremities, uh, the exam is, you know, one, maybe two plus pitting edema, um, bilateral lower extremities, right? So we've seen this patient, uh, or seen patients very similar to this. Um, so, um, that's, that's kind of our, our, our patient, right? Um, Here's the ultrasound, the the the, bed, the basic ultrasound, and I pilfered this one, um, you know, shamelessly from the internet, um, for full disclosure. Uh, 
Uh, but this is what we'd see uh, if we did bedside ultrasound on this patient. Um, so uh, I'm going to just start, you know, throw it out there. Z, what do you think about this ultrasound? Kind of what, what jumps out to you uh, about this particular study? Um, is Z on there? Yeah. Hey, uh, Matt, this yeah. is Ashish. Uh, the pictures are uh, kind of, uh, you know, they're not playing smoothly. Um, they're just, uh, you know, sort of breaking up, I guess. Okay. Maybe the speed of the connection. Um, well, then, so, I'll, then um, I'll interpret it. <laughs> How does that sound? What's that? I'll interpret it. Um, no, I, I, I can still make out what's going on, but it's it's not you know, okay. the most accurate. Yeah, we've been playing with the frame rate on this one, and it kind of, the frame rate is kind of lousy on the on the playback. So, I see. Unfortunately, okay. I can't really help you out that much in that capacity, but well, yeah, that's okay. Um, so, Z, are you are you there? Maybe not. Um, so, Ashish, I'll, I'll just throw this out to you, kind of in, from a cardiologist okay. perspective. Kind of, what do you think about yeah. this study? So, uh, from the cardiac perspective, uh, you know, the the left sided um, upper frame with the four chambers of the apical four chamber view. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone is is uh, aware of the nomenclature. I see ER name, so you guys know this pretty well. Uh, the image in the in the right lower hand corner is the short axis view through the mid ventricle, and um, or at the cortical level, slightly below the mitral valve level. And what you're seeing on the apical four chamber view is um, is that there's dysfunction of both the left and right ventricle. The left ventricle the left ventricle is uh, has systolic dysfunction. Obviously, it cannot comment in diastolic dysfunction on this image. Um, EF is hard to estimate with the slow frame rate. Uh, it seems that the right ventricle may be mildly dilated, uh, and it seems like both atria may be mildly dilated. Um, in the uh, short axis view, um, you know, you see the same thing, you know, ven ventricular function is moderately to severely de depressed, I would say, if I were to take a guess, probably 30-35%. And there's a small pericardial effusion, which you appreciate in the short axis view. Uh, again, one has to measure that in the um, in, in end diastole, uh, preferably in the parasternal long axis view and not this view, but this can be used if needed. Yeah, so that's, I, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So, sorry, the the audio was off, and now I'm back on. <laughs> no okay. worries. So, so Z, what do you think about? I mean, I don't want you to challenge a cardiologist's interpretation of his own study, but do you do you concur with what she said, or have anything else to add? I should say. Uh, I heard, I heard, I heard partially of what she said, but I'll probably agree with she. <laughs> <laughs> But, but what, I, what I'm worried about here, or in particular in those patients, is their RV dysfunction. And I, I can see, at least from the apical view, is that the uh, tricuspid annulus uh, seems to move reasonably well, although the TAPSI is not exactly measured. The size of the RV is, is, is uh, good enough. Um, the size of the LV is, is, a little, uh, is a little big. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but at least it's not an empty ventricle. And I think that you guys both kind of hit on what I was hoping, you know, we could kind of notice out of this image. And I apologize about the frame rate. Um, but basically, um, let's see if I can turn my, my – oh, I got out of my presentation. Sorry about that. Frame rate really went bad. Uh, what I was hoping you guys would see on this one is, is again, that low EF, um, you know, in this patient. Um, and – you know, the slightly dilated ventricle in that pericardial effusion. Um, so based on the information that you see here, Ashish, kind of in, in the clinical presentation that we that we laid out, kind of what do you think uh, is going on kind of in your head as you're kind of starting to frame you know, a, a differential diagnosis? Um, so that's a great question. I think there's a couple of things you need to know. You need to know there's a previous echocardiogram. So let's, um, the, let's say it's normal. It, What's that normal? Okay. Yeah. So if this is, if the previous echocardiogram, and again, the timing of the previous echocardiogram is important, but, you know, if she's mild hypertensive who's on a low dose of lisinopril uh, with a previously normal echo, this can be assumed to be a new change. And if this is something new, then you'd obviously be concerned about a process in which there's biventricular dysfunction, uh, which is of acute onset, right? Mm -hmm. And mm 
the there's a broad differential diagnosis for that, but you know, like you said, a myocarditis would be um, high on the list. Um, you know, sepsis can certainly cause a global bi biventricular dysfunction. And based upon the clinical history, um, it seems to me that the patient's tachycardic just trying to compensate for the drop in cardiac output. So there's been an acute uh, change in cardiac output and acute decrease. The only way that the patient can compensate in the initial phase is actually by increasing their heart rate. And uh, they're hypotensive clearly and they're tachycardic. I think they're in a state of, uh, of shock, potentially an element of cardiogenic shock, but there could be distributive shock as well. I don't know whether or not the patient's septic in addition to that. Sure. And I, I certainly didn't put in a, a you know preceding clinical scenario, but kind of in light of current events, we can just presume that they have some viral syndrome uh, that preceded this ED visit, um, you know, in light of that. So I, I think kind of what I'm trying to get at here and what I'm trying to hone us into and kind of what how I want to kind of pursue the rest of this conversation is is kind of talking about myocarditis, right? And use this as a as a case to kind of seed that discussion of, of myocarditis. Um so so that's great. So uh, Ashish, can you can you kind of fill us in? Just let's let's zoom out for a for a minute. Like kind of put bedside ultrasound to the to the side for just a sec. Zoom out just clinically, big picture, what is myocarditis? Um and what causes it? What I mean, why do we get myocarditis? Just so we can kind of set a, a definitional framework here to build everything else on. Right. So so myocarditis is any condition that leads to inflammation of the myocardium with a necrosis of the myocardial cells. Okay. So for the diagnosis of myocarditis to be made, you need certain criteria. You need to exclude uh, coronary artery disease as the cause of the myocardial dysfunction, which can be accomplished by various techniques, uh, the most important being coronary angiography. But you don't always need coronary angiography uh, to exclude myocarditis. Um, you can perform other testing as well. Um, and then um, some of the ECG findings can be suggestive of myocarditis. Most commonly, you'll see um, uh, T-wave changes, uh, you know, and sometimes you'll see ST shifts as well. Uh, what's been described in COVID is, is very peculiar, which is ST elevation similar to ST elevation myocardial infarction. And these patients um, have been taken to the lab and have been found to have normal coronary arteries. A couple of things to remember, myocarditis is most, is most commonly in the non-COVID patients is an idiopathic disease, and it's been thought to be secondary to a viral illness of some sort. Um, you know, the, mo the most common viruses that lead to uh, myocarditis are um, no notably Coxsackie virus, adenovirus, and the, and the viruses that typically lead to common colds. Of course, the SARS viruses have also been linked with myocarditis. Uh, influenza has been linked with myocarditis. So most of the times it's related to a, um, a viral illness. Um, you know, and it's, but you know, in previous studies, when they've done biopsies of the myocardium uh, in patients with suspected myocarditis, the viral inclusion particles have not been found. But what has been found is a monocytic infiltrate with myocardial necrosis which is a marker of inflammation. Um, and in some instances, if you perform a viral serology, uh, you will find elevated viral serology, most frequently IgG and not so much IgM. Um, in, in, the, in the COVID patient population, uh, the myocarditis generally takes um, a global form, uh, but in, in the majority of myocarditis patients, you will see an element of pericarditis which is pericardial inflammation, sometimes a small pericardial effusion. And you'll see focal wall motion abnormalities, not so much global wall motion abnormalities. So that's cause number one. Other causes of myocarditis can be autoimmune diseases, which is a lot less common. Uh, and clinically, we really hardly ever see it. Uh, there's a particular entity which is uh, known as giant cell myocarditis, which is thought to be autoimmune uh, myocarditis. Uh, which is perhaps the most malignant form of myocarditis that we know of, and it can lead to rapid congestive heart failure and rapid, um, you know, uh, cardiogenic shock. And it's one of the common causes um, of cardiogenic uh, of cardiac transplant. Unfortunately, it can come back in transplanted hearts as well. So that's 
sort of the lay of the land. I mean, you know, bacterial myocarditis is, is virtually unknown. Um, I don't think it's particularly common. Drug-induced myocarditis can occur, but for the most part, we're talking about viruses. Clinically, again, as I, I'm going to repeat, what you'll see in most instances is focal left ventricular dysfunction, less commonly right ventricular dysfunction, and um, global myocarditis is not that common. What, you, what you'll see is is generally folk of all motion abnormalities. Gotcha. And um, you, and so I think the key point there, and this is definitely consistent with the reading I've been do doing, is your big cause is to be viral, right? So the, the history should have some, you know, idea of like, you know, hey, I had this viral syndrome, and then now I'm having these these cardiac symptoms. Um, that's going to kind of lead you down that route to, to make you think of this viral myocarditis. Um, Ashish, we've you, you mentioned a little bit about COVID in particular, um, and I think you kind of answered this question, but I wanted to highlight it a little bit. Um, you know, in my reading, I've, I've come across three potential mechanisms for, for why this happens, right? Direct myocardial inflammation, this exaggerated like cytokine storm, hyperinflammatory response, or severe hypoxia causing like oxidative stress and, and myocardial injury. Do you have any sense as to which, if any of those are kind of involved uh, or some combination of the above um, in terms of the etiology of this? So it seems like, uh, you know, there's case reports, of course, at this point, because the 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 best uh, diagnostic tool for making the diagnosis of myocarditis really is cardiac MRI. And typically what we've rel relied upon in the past are called the Lake Louise criteria. And now we don't use them because MRI has shown that um, there are additional of uh, you know, there are additional sequences in cardiac MR that are particularly helpful. So from the case reports that are available from Europe, and I don't believe there's been that many cardiac MR reports from China, but certainly from France and England that um, and Italy, that patients have a couple of different forms or causes of cardiac dysfunction. So there are in individuals in whom there is diffuse severe myocardial edema, uh, without any evidence of myocardial, uh, significant evidence of myocardial necrosis. And these are individuals that seem to be behaving like a severe form of stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And, um, you know, they don't have a particularly high troponin value. And that is what we see in stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Stress-induced cardiomyopathy frequently is associated with ST elevations as well, but the prognosis is not terrible. It's not great. At least in the short term, the prognosis can be bad. But if the illness is ongoing, patients may not recover because stress-induced cardiomyopathy, also known as Takotsubo syndrome, uh, can lead to a significant decrease in cardiac output. So the issue is, um, you know, that is certainly a subset of these patients from what I've read. Uh, and, and for those who have not seen a lot of these patients, um, right ventricular involvement in Takotsubo um, uh, cardiomyopathy is not uncommon. We, you know, we encounter it in, in about one third of all the patients. And um, the the earlier you scan these people, the more likely you are to pick up the right ventricular involvement in Takotsubo patients, which tend which tends to recover more quickly than the left ventricular um, aspect. So that's one. The second, uh, the mechanism, the other mechanism that I've seen it seems to be a diffuse, dense myocardial infiltration with, with lymphocytes. And it seems to secrete a lot of cytokines like IL-6, which can cause myocardial necrosis by itself. Um, what also has been hypothesized from what I have read is that, the, you know, COVID uh, is, is a particularly prothrombotic state. As you guys have seen, there's a lot of DVT, there's a lot of pulmonary emboli, and there may be microvascular plugging uh, or, you know, of, of the coronary small, small vessel vasculature with, um, you know, microthrombi, which is leading to really, really significant um, infarcts. And that's leading to marked elevations in troponin, uh, in D-dimer, and, and, you know, in markers of inflammation in general. So it seems like there's a host of different mechanisms at play. I think um, cytokines are certainly playing an important role, but I, I think microthrombosis may also... Uh, be playing a significant role because this this myocarditis is really really severe. Like it leads it's it's a fulminant kind of myocarditis and the worst kind of um, left ventricular thrombi that have ever been described have been described with this illness. 
And then um, before we move on, just one other point I want to touch on real quick um, in about two minutes. Um, and then we'll kind of move on to become more clinical and, and ultrasound based. Um, but in my reading of the literature, they, they define, they seem to define this into acute, uh, or uh, excuse me, fulminant myocarditis versus acute myocarditis. Is that a distinction that you guys, um, you guys utilize? Uh, and if so, can you kind of yeah. define that a little bit for us just so that can, we can help kind of know our terms as we move forward? Right. So fulminant myocarditis is what we've typically talked about with giant cell myocarditis, where there's a significant and severe drop in cardiac output such that uh, you go into cardiogenic shock, right? So these are patients that, you know, are behaving like fulminant myocarditis. Our COVID patients are very much like giant cell in their presentation. So if there is a significant enough drop in cardiac output such that, such that the patient is, is in a low cardiac output state, it would be it would be reasonable to call them fulminant myocarditis. For patients that are have a low level troponin elevation and have a small regional uh, dysfunction with an EF of say 50, 55%, um, th that's more, uh, you know, acute myocarditis, which is, is, is far more common in the, in the non-COVID era. Sure. Uh, so let's climb out of the weeds a little bit. Um, you know, we've been kind of talking a lot about the pathophysiology, right? Um, and let's just, let's start approaching this more from a clinical perspective, because while the pathophysiology is fun, and I kind of like to nerd out on that, um, practically speaking, we're at the bedside with, with people, not textbooks, right? So, um, you know, we, we need to start figuring out how to dis distinguish this when we see it laying, you know, in front of us with, with a head, two arms and two legs, right? Um, so we are breezing. So um, Matt, just, uh, go just ahead. a note, uh, mm -hmm. just a note, because you, you asked the question, is, is hypoxia responsible? And, sure. uh, I, I looked up a little bit on, on, uh, on this issue. And the nice thing about ARDSNET studies is that anybody who comes in with an ARDS has by definition excluded myocardial dysfunction. Uh, so in the ARDSNET, the, the, the last one, uh, the, the biggest one we, we, we remember is the FACT trial. Uh, by day seven, only 4% of those patients had myocardial dysfunction. So these are patients who started off without any myocardial dysfunction at day seven, only uh, or day eight, only four percent had it, and by by one month, uh, about twenty percent had some myocardial dysfunction. But if if you expect severe acute myocardial dysfunction to start with the severe acute hypoxia, it actually doesn't. Just to just to ex exonerate the lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so so as we kind of go clinical here, uh, we're presenting. You know, we in the ED are presented with an undifferentiated cohort of patients, you know, for a variety of reasons. And this is just what we're used to, right? Chest pain and shortness of breath can mean a whole number of different things, depending on kind of what the clinical scenario is, right? Um, and even if we kind of narrow things down, right? If we get people on the floor, put people in the unit, where we kind of narrowed things already, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, respiratory complaints that could be, you know, that need to be teased out. Um, so when should we begin to worry about myocarditis? Like what symptoms that we're seeing uh, in our patients in the ED or, or admitted should start cluing us into the fact that this is an etiology versus something else? And uh, Z, I'm going to throw this to you first um, to kind of to, to, to riff on a little bit. And then, then Ashish, you can kind of fill in a little bit after that. Hmm. So um, really, I mean, if you're talking clinically, and you have someone with an undifferentiated shock, it's, it's always in the back of our minds is the heart involved directly. Uh, so, um, and for, for us, it's very important because if we're going to exclude cardiac disease to treat the patient as pure ARDS, then we're not going to, then we're, we're not gonna worry as much about um, filling time and uh, the forward flow. So uh, really, we have to we have to look right away, and we do it almost all the time with anybody with severe hypoxia. After that, to differentiate if the heart is uh, is really primary or secondary is uh, probably by default we're going to um, start the patient on on general pressors, leave off bed, and try to diurese them to help the lung if the hypoxia is severe enough. And I'm assuming this is the case in a COVID patient who comes in with severe hypoxia immediately intubated. Uh, that that's all. Did I answer the question? I don't think I answered. Okay. But. Yeah. So, Ashish, what else would you want to add? Like, what what should we be looking for clinically 
that would kind of clue us into into this diagnosis, right? Right. So, so I think uh, it, it's it's a diagnosis of exclusion. First of all, one has to be absolutely certain that you, you know, and and I'm not be just speaking the COVID standpoint. I'm speaking in general. Okay. So let's be very careful here. So. In, in patients that present to the emergency room with chest pain and evidence of myocardial necrosis, um, we uh, do get concerned about ACS as being the first possibility. And acute coronary syndrome, as everyone knows, is the result of ruptured or fissured uh, plaque and platelet aggregation. But of course, myocarditis has a different etiology, it's my direct myocardial inflammation. The, but the presentation is tremendously similar. So on the basis of clinical features, it's almost impossible to differentiate between these two um, diagnoses. So the way to go about suspecting this is, of course, you know, you got a troponin elevation in patient with chest pain and nonspecific ECG findings, or, you know, you can even get ST depressions and T-wave changes in myocarditis. The next step is to, of course, perform a cardiac catheterization, and, you know, you'll say, okay, well, now we have a situation where the cardiac cath does not show any acute lesions. It, you may have chronic disease, but you got to see plaque rupture and evidence of acute lesions. If you don't see that, the next step is to go to an MRI, and that's how we make our diagnosis here. Um, you know, it is not a benign disease, you know, even if you have a small region of, uh, you know, myocardial involvement, most commonly on the MR, for those of you who are interested, you'll see... Um, gadolinium uptake in the subepicardial region of the myocardium. So the outside part of the myocardium is most commonly involved, whereas with infarction related to coronary artery disease, the subendocardium, which is the most susceptible to ischemia, is the part that gets infarcted. So in myocarditis, the pattern follows the subepicardium, which is not a coronary pattern, and it does not follow any particular coronary distribution. So it can be patchy, it can be multifocal, it can, you know, also in the acute phase appear bigger than what it's going to turn out to be eventually. So because there's a significant element of inflammation and that makes the area appear much worse in the acute setting than what it will three months from the initial. Uh, but, you know, these regions of scar in the myocardium are, are a foci for the development of cardiac arrhythmia. So, you know, down the line, these patients are at significantly increased risk of developing uh, ventricular tachyrhythmias and can be a cause of sudden death, especially in those that have a drop in ejection fraction. Yeah, that's kind of, um, you know, kind of goes along with what, what I was reading. Um, you know, and from our perspective, from the, from the ED and, you know, for the residents that are on the call, um, you know, this should be on your differential for people presenting with a variety of symptoms, you know, cardiac symptoms, you know, including chest pain, including shortness of breath, including heart failure, uh, exacerbation. Although if they've got known ischemic heart failure, then it's probably less likely, but, um, you know, or even like patients with elevated biomarkers, again, I kind of liken it to the Takatsubo that you mentioned earlier, Ashish, where it's like, I'm not going to go directly to that as my diagnosis, um, based on my, my ultrasound, uh, but it certainly is on my list, and once I get those clean coronaries evaluated, then that kind of rises up on the list or, or falls off the list, depending on kind of what I see. Does that that sound fair? Yeah, it's it's fair. You know, the the important thing to remember is that Takosubo tends to follow this uh, focal distrib uh, distribution of all motion mm -hmm. abnormalities, which are quite peculiar. And uh, you you know you'll see uh, most commonly you'll see the entire apex of the involved. And then it ex sometimes extends into the apex and the mid-ventricle. There are atypical patterns of Takotsubo involvement, which can be purely just the base of the ventricle, and it spares the mid and the apical left ventricle. Or there could be Takotsubo where only the mid-left ventricle is involved and the base and the apex are spared. Those are less, much less common. But these, the involvement of Takotsubo of the ventricle is very symmetrical. Okay, so... The apex, you can almost draw a line from left to right, and it follows that line, and nothing else really looks like it, okay, except for sometimes you can confuse the apical takosubo with a left anterior descending artery infarct, because that can look quite similar. Even the ECG can look similar to that. Myocarditis can be tricky because, you know, myocarditis can lead to multifocal abnormalities, so you can have many different parts of the myocardium which are, like, not moving, and they're not following a coronary distribution. So those are the clues, especially in, say, someone young, right? You have a 35-year-old who comes with chest pain, uh, 
non-smoker, non-hypertensive, cholesterol's okay, and they have this weird chest pain. It's like, you know, doesn't seem to go away, gets worse with breathing. So you're like, okay, well, you know, it's going to the trapezius, trapezius ridge. You're like, okay, there's an element of pericarditis going on. And they have a little troponin elevation, like, okay, well, what's going on here? Then you investigate further, and it turns out to be myocarditis. So that's your patient population where you can start suspecting myocarditis without an angiogram. But in, in the majority of the individuals, um, the diagnosis gets established following coronary investigation. Yeah, so just kind of recap a little bit before we move to the ultrasound. I think it's good just kind of remember the differential for this. You know, obviously, he's going to include acute coronary syndrome, you know, ischemic cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo's, um, you know, heart failure, exhaustion, a lot of these different cardiac things um, that are going to get us into that pathway that, that myocarditis, myocarditis can also present as. And I, I like what you've been what you've been describing, Ashish, um, with it doesn't fit it's got some findings of like st changes in the ekg or abnormalities in the echo that doesn't necessarily fit a coronary distribution right um because it doesn't this this is a disease that doesn't necessarily hit up coronary specific coronary dis distribution so i think that's helpful um and then you know the w one way i like to think about it and i think i have this later on in my notes here um is to think about the sequelae of this right if you inflame a tissue right you're going to cause dysfunction of that tissue in the myocardium the dysfunction you're going to get is it doesn't work so lv dysfunction and number two is well it conducts electricity so it's not going to conduct it as well and so what you said earlier i like is um you know beware of those arrhythmias that may develop and also think about this in your sudden sudden cardiac death patients. So right now there's been some talk in the ED world and I imagine it's probably trickled out. Like if someone's cardiac, coming in cardiac arrest, we're gowning up for potential COVID patient because, you know, we're seeing people in the literature dying of COVID, right? And so this may be, this may be the cause of that, of that acute cardiac arrest. So something to think about uh, down in the ED. But uh, moving on from there, let's talk a little bit about, um, about ultrasound, right? Because that's kind of the whole point of this. And I think that's why everyone got on. So, Ashish, can ultrasound make this diagnosis? Ultrasound can lead you to the diagnosis, but it's not sufficient. Okay, so the the gold standard, it you can you can sort of start thinking about it. Okay, uh, but it cannot be the only diagnostic tool. I think it takes more than one diagnostic tool to make a definite diagnosis of myocarditis. And, and that's kind of what I've suspected, right? Because uh, as you and I have talked about this, um, we've, we've talked about you know, the, the role of cardiac MRI, um, and it produces images that I, that I cannot duplicate on my ultrasound. Um, but I think, you know, like, like you were alluding to, there are some findings that kind of get us down that path. So can you describe a little bit um, kind of what we're looking for um, on an echo uh, that may kind of alert us to this is a possibility of what's going on? Yeah, so uh, as I was uh, mentioning a little bit earlier, you know, you you may see a region of focal left ventricular dysfunction, okay? Frequently, the lateral wall of the myocardium gets involved in myocarditis patients, okay? Uh, sometimes you'll see septal involvement, but most commonly you'll see basal to mid-lateral and inferior wall involvement. So if you see, a say, a segment of the myocardium in the mid-lateral wall, and that's it's only one segment that is not moving, and the rest of the myocardium is absolutely okay. It does not make any coronary sense for that to occur, right? Because now we're talking about a small branch of an obtuse marginal or a small branch of the posterior descending artery, which is obviously uh, the right coronary artery. So that would be highly unlikely uh, by itself, right? So you have to think of something else. If you see that, on your, on your echocardiogram or an audio ultrasound, you should start thinking about myocarditis, especially if the pain is not your typical acute coronary syndrome pain, okay? Although the pain can be almost identical, so you cannot really depend upon the characteristics of the pain. The second thing that you may find helpful uh, would be a pericardial effusion, right? So, you know, we all know that acute pericarditis is frequently... Without a pericardial effusion, in fact, the majority of patients with acute pericarditis don't have a pericardial effusion, right? It is only later that you uh, develop a pericardial effusion, but if you do have one, uh, then it may be helpful, you know? And pericardial effusion, as you guys are well aware, um, is is for to be looked for in the apical four-chamber view and the parasternal long-axis view. 
uh, you measure it in the parasternal long axis view where you actually measure the left left ventricular internal dimension that's the place where you measure it and that's the place where it's supposed to be reported the other place that we measure and report the pericardial effusion is above the right atrium so uh, those are the two places where you can see the pericardial effusion develop most early on it can of course be just about anywhere but those are the two places which are the most dependent and that's where you'll see effusions develop so if you see those two findings i think um, you can start thinking about myocarditis uh, but apart from that there's nothing else that's specific on echocardiography that can necessarily help you uh, go to a diagnosis of myocarditis sure so let's 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 break these apart a little bit, right? So this slide that I got on, um, I don't know what the frame rate's doing for y'all, but um, basically the top left is that image you saw earlier, right? The decreased ejection fraction, um, mildly dilated with a small pericardial effusion. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's this patient, right? The bottom is normal, right? Got a normal uh, ejection fraction, um, no effusion. Um, uh, I just lost my lost my place here. Um, so, Z, let, let me bring you back in here. Kind of, how do you uh, in the unit assess kind of LV function? You know, how, how are you looking at at studies like this and kind of saying this is normal, this is abnormal? So, of course, we have a, a binary view, a, a binary approach to to answering the question rather than how much of this is contributing to this. The question, can I rule it in or can I rule it out, either of, of the two ways. The, the most common, although, although we try to measure cardiac output and try to, to, to use uh, passive leg raising, the, the most common is really to look at the fill of the LV. Is this contributing to the shock? Is this an overfilled state that I can help the lung by diuresing the patient? Most of the time, it's the basic four views much less of the time we're probably going to use uh, EPSS and uh, measuring cardiac output we we're still we're still practicing and learning it because it's um, it's useful when it when the when the views are really good but when the views views are not and 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 we we can get a good um, outflow uh, pulse doppler, uh, pulse wave doppler on the uh, LVOT then we we won't be able to get the the measurement uh, but but again, we're, we're doing a, uh, we're trying to figure out is what I see in the heart related or the cause of what's happening in in the blood pressure or in the lungs. Uh, but we we don't have any any uh, any other tricks other than the visual um, visual estimate of uh, of contractility and fill. Uh, I try to push the fellows away from trying to figure out the ejection fraction because you can have a great ejection fraction with very poor forward flow. Or you can have an ejection fraction that looks crappy, but the person is still awake and alert and has normal body function, organ function. Maybe I should tighten up my my terminology here, um, you know, because sometimes we use ejection fraction kind of synony synonymously with LV function. But um, you know, I think like UZ, I think we in the ED kind of use a, a general, you know, gestalt view. Um, you know, and this is kind of certainly. Kind of how we look at it is like let's break this patient up into normal um you know mildly reduced or severely reduced um lv function right um and you know can we look at this and say do they fit one of those categories um you know it's kind of how to how to define that um the other things that i use to teach um you know my my learners is you know is the wall moving right is there a wall motion abnormality um like is the whole wall moving is it is it thickening uh, kind of circumferentially. Those are kind of functions, um, you know, that I would use to kind of assess the LV function. Um, and then we oftentimes, when we do want to document it, you know, we'll, we'll use the EPSS technique, uh, measuring kind of that, you know, septal leaflet distance to the, or the leaflet distance of the anterior leaflet of mitral valve to the septum. And if it's less than seven, we'll consider that, you know, correlates with, with normal LV function. Um, Ashish, do you have any other recommendations for how we should measure LV function? Um, you know, at the bedside in these patients, obviously Simpsons is probably not going to be applicable, you know, broadly down in the ED, but do you, do you have recommendations of how we should look at this? Yeah. So I, I think, uh, you guys are exactly right. Uh, you know, the, uh, a normal left ventricular ejection fraction is not synonymous with a normal cardiac output. Uh, 
and a low ejection fraction is not synonymous with a low cardiac output. Uh, so the issue is how quickly did the change occur because the body adapts to a certain cardiac output and if there is an acute change, that makes a big difference. Uh, patients uh, with a small ventricle, which, use, which is what you'll frequently see in patients, older patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, tend to have a small heart, okay? And if your end diastolic volume is 65 milliliters or 70 milliliters, and your ejection fraction is 70%, your stroke volume is about 45 milliliters, right? Which is not fantastic. So, and if your body is stressed, right? Imagine the patient develops fever or, you know, any condition that leads to shock or whatever, your cardiac output can only increase by increasing heart rate. So you become tachycardic and, you know, your stroke volume is kind of fixed. It cannot go any higher than your EF can go from 70 to 80 percent. But that'll improve your stroke volume by only about five or seven milliliters. So you're still talking about a pretty bad situation. On the other hand, you have a ventricle that's 300 milliliters to begin with and your ejection fraction is 20 percent. You've got a stroke volume of 60. But of course, they're, um, you know, at uh, sort of the far extreme limb of their, you know, um, pressure volume loop, and they cannot really improve their cardiac output because they're sort of already overstretched. So that's a bit of a digression, but let's talk a little bit about what can be used to measure a crude ejection fraction at the bedside, right? So, you know, the E-point separation slope is, you know, is, is, is used to be a very popular measurement, uh, which is, you know, you're showing an M mode of that. Um, is the distance between the E point, uh, if you could point to it, and then the septum, uh, the distance between the E point and the septum my, is a marker of not, left ventricular function, right? My cursor's not working, but I'm just going to describe it here. The E point is going to be this e, the tip of the E wave, which is the taller of the two uh, peaks. Uh, so the right. taller of the two and the A wave, the atrial kick wave, is that the shorter of the yeah. two. So, and then the, the thick right. line just above it is the septum. So how close does the top of the peak of the E wave get to the bottom of the septum there? Right, so in, in, in end diastole, a distance of more than 1.2 centimeters is considered to be indicative of, um, you know, low cardiac output state. But this is, this is typically being studied in chronic patients, okay? In an acute patient where, you know, uh, Bob Jones was asking this question, like, you know, you can have acute dilatation in patients such as a myocarditis. Uh, so you can have acute left ventricular dilatation, but it's not that common. So the EPSS can be misleading. The one thing that I can tell you is, is much more helpful, especially in those with um, global dysfunction, right? I'm not talking about left ventricles that have focal dysfunction. I'm talking about global dysfunction now, which means the entire ventricle is down, is the uh, fractional shortening, right? So that is the end diastolic distance in the parasternal view, and then the end systolic, uh, you know, distance between uh, the septum and the posterior wall, okay? So there is something called the Tycholes ejection fraction method, which was the M-mode ejection fraction method before we had 2D echo. This is, I'm talking about the 1970s and early 1980s, right? So the distance by which the difference, the distance by which, uh, let me, let me, let me rephrase this. So there's a certain distance between the septum and the posterior wall in end diastole. And then in end systole, since these two structures come closer to each other, the, the difference in the end diastole to end systole can be used to calculate the ejection fraction, especially in those patients where you have a globally distributed dysfunction of the cardiac output. Now, you're showing the end diastolic dimension, right? Well, if you were to uh, show... Kind of. I, you're going to bust me on this one, but this is the best picture I have. The, no, this, the this artery is valve good. is wide open, so it's actually early systole, but it's, it's yeah. as close as I can get. Right. So this is great. <laughs> so this is end diastole or early systole, right? Most likely because I don't see the aortic valve. But when you have... And if you were to advance this frame to end systole... The red line's obviously going to get shorter, right? Everyone knows that. So you can calculate an ejection fraction by, by how much the red line shortens, okay? And that's called fractional shortening, okay? So if you use that, that's very helpful. The second thing you can do is do a M mode of the aortic valve itself, okay? 
So if you look at the opening of the aortic valve, and I don't think we have a picture here, but you no, can it's wide open here. It's where the it's where the the dotted caliper is. Right, right, exactly. But what I'm you know, if you do an M mode of the aortic valve, right? So as the aortic valve opens, the aortic valve opens in the shape of a box. Okay, it's it's a rectangular box in M mode. And the shape of the rectangular box is a nice, beautiful rectangle that opens big and wide, okay, in a patient that has normal cardiac output. In patients with a low cardiac output, the latter edge of the box, and I wish I could draw here, it, it sort of actually trails off, okay? So it becomes triangular towards the end, which is showing that the left ventricular squeeze is trailing off towards the end of ejection, okay? So it no longer is a is a horizontal rectangle, it, the, cha the shape changes, it almost becomes a thimble shape, right? So the base is that of a rectangle, but then it sort of tapers off towards the apex. And I'm happy to share an example with you because we see this all the time. So those are things that are very helpful in addition to the EPSS. The EPSS is easy to do and that is why people like it. But those are the other two things that are certainly very helpful in, in patients with uh, with global dysfunction, of course, the aortic valve M mode is 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 actually agnostic to uh, global or focal dysfunction. Because if you have poor cardiac output, the aortic valve ejection is not going to look any. You know, it won't change. You know, if it's poor, it's poor. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the the fractional shortening is a good extra trick that we can kind of throw in our tool bag because uh, as we're assessing these patients, because I think it makes sense. Um, you know, if we don't have a long-standing disease process, we may not have that chamber dilation. It's actually kind of what I wanted to get to next a little bit. Because um, some of the, the, one of the papers I was reading, the literature was a little bit, not the literature, but the, the, the presentation was a little bit conflicting on, on you know, LV di um, diastolic diameter, uh, whether or not it's big versus, or versus normal uh, in patients with, with acute, per or acute myocarditis. Um, the other thing that they were talking about, and Jashish, you can comment on this one, is wall thickness. You know, in other capacities of inflammation, we we see things thickening. If we do cellulitis, the subcutaneous tissue thickens. If we do cholecystitis, the gallbladder wall thickens. Do you see um, a similar thickening, uh, or can you see a similar thickening on echo? That's a great question. Okay, so that's that's a difficult question based upon the echo. Again, you've got to have, there's a couple of things to remember. Okay, so if your patient has... A, a decrease in intravascular volume for whatever reason. Your left ventricular walls become thicker because the left ventricle is less distended, okay? So in the same patient, if, you, if they become really dehydrated or intravascularly depleted and the ventricle becomes small, your walls are going to be thicker because the balloon is now less distended, so the walls of the balloon are thicker. However, what you're asking me is a totally different question, and I'll get to that in a second. So, and the, when you give these patients volume, because, you know, we get consulted for hypotension in the intensive, surgical intensive care unit in particular, and you see these patients have really small ventricles, and they're underfilled, and the mitral valve is sort of obstructing the outflow tract because of systolic anterior motion, behaving just like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you have dynamic outflow tract obstruction because the patient has a small ventricle, they're sympathetically charged, and so on and so forth. And then... Just we, all we do is tell them, hey, uh, give them fluids and beta blockers and you fix the hypotension, okay? And it usually takes care of the problem. But what you're asking me is a different question. So in myocarditis patients, you can certainly have wall thickening, absolutely true. But since myocarditis tends to be so focal, uh, echo may not have adequate spatial resolution to show wall thickness in one particular segment, especially if you're not going to be using contrast. However, if the ventricular size has not changed, and if you have a diffuse myocarditis-like process, you will see wall thickness on the myocardium, especially in fulminant myocarditis, such as what we see in giant cell and in COVID patients. Okay, so that has been known, very well described, especially in the MR literature. Okay, so if you do cardiac MR on these patients, you have sequences that can pick up acute inflammation, wall thickening, and all of that stuff, and can actually distinguish between various different etiologies. And, and since this is not an MRI talk, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's the most sensitive technique to pick up wall thickness. So your point is very well taken that wall thickness does increase in myocarditis patients, but it has to be 
a severe fulminant type of myocarditis. Yeah, and so this data here um, is from a small, I didn't put the reference on it, but it's a, um, it's a s small study, um, a s well, 700 patients, so it's larger than my studies that I've done. Um, but basically, it's from the... Um, a, uh, um, from the Journal of American College of Cardiology about 20 years ago um, about echocardiac findings in um, acute versus fulminant myocarditis, right? Um, and so I think universally, you know, reduced ejection fraction, um, you know, is, is seen. Uh, and then they were making the differentiation uh, between, you know, acute myocarditis and fulminant myocarditis. And they saw some differences between LV size and septal thickness, right? Kind of going along with what you're saying, if you have this really wicked fulminant myocarditis, you may have some septal thickening, you may have some, um, you know, some dilation of the, of the cardiac chamber. Uh, but again, I think with, with the variety of disease you may see, I, I don't know if any one of these in exclusion is going to be adequate in, in kind of making that diagnosis. Does that sound fair? Fair assessment? Yes, it is a fair assessment. This is this is obviously uh, data that's pretty old, yeah. And um, but it's still very helpful. You know, if you're seeing again, you it, the, the thickening of the wall is to be in the context of what is previously known about the patient, right? So if you have a prior echo where the ventricular, I'm talking about Fulman and myocarditis now. You have a prior echo, okay, and the left ventricular end diastolic dimension is say 5.5 centimeters, which is towards the upper limits of normal. And then they show up with fulminant and myocarditis. Now the wall, the end diastolic dimension is 6.2 centimeters. And your septal thickness has actually gone up. And the posterior wall thickness has gone up instead of having gone down. You're like, what is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. What can also, what you can pick up sometimes is a, a certain amount of bogginess in the wall. And, you know, you might see a different echogenicity. Mm -hmm. But again, that is for someone that is extremely experienced and, you know, you, it would be hypothesis generating at best, you know, I don't think you can make a big case of that, but I, I can imagine the echogenicity of the myocardium changing with myocardial edema. We certainly pick it up on MRI, but I don't think there are any studies with echo to show that echogenicity of the myocardium changes with, with the presence of fluid or not. I'm sure it does change. Yeah. And, and let me just wrap this this section up, and then we'll move on to the clinical management to kind of to round out this this discussion today. Um, in the literature, there's a ton of different findings that would suggest myocarditis. There's a bunch of case reports saying, "Hey, we found this, and it's myocarditis," and we found this is myocarditis. Um, echogenicity uh, is one of them. There's a case that talked about the velvet velvet myocardium, um, and um, you know, there's some studies about speckle tracking to to kind of help to help suggest these kind of advanced techniques. But I think for, for our audience, right, for the bedside clinicians in the ED and the critical care unit um, and around the hospital, um, you know, I think really focusing in on what's that, what's that LV function doing, right? Is that abnormal? Because if it is, then this is going to be high on my, my list. Um, and then some of these other things may help suggest it, but really not going to be the game changers um, in terms of LV size or, or septal thickness. Does that sound fair? Or can I, can I say, you know, if the, the, the LV function is normal, that this kind of drops down on my list and I may be looking for other things, I guess. Is that? Well, so the LV function could be completely normal in acute myocarditis, okay? You may not see any wall motion abnormality at all in echocardiography. And you may pick up wall motion abnormalities and edema and inflammation on MRI. So that also happens quite a bit. But the, the good news is that these patients have a good prognosis, Okay. So the prognosis in myocarditis is dependent heavily upon two things. There's two, two things that turn out to be the most important in multivariable studies that have looked at this in patients with acute myocarditis. I'm not speaking of fulminant myocarditis right now. Number one is the ejection fraction, okay? Number two is the amount of scar, okay? So, you know, if the ejection fraction decreases, that's not a good prognostic sign. Uh, you know, if it drops to, say, 50% with focal wall motion abnormalities, or if you have extensive regions of myocarditis in the myocardium, uh, it, it is a marker of arrhythmic risk, so there's a high risk of sudden cardiac death in these patients down the line. So those are the prognostic factors that have stood the test of time. Sure. So let's move on a little bit. Um, I'm going to put the, the picture of this one up just to kind of to have something to look at uh, when we talk about. Let's move on a little bit to, and wrap this up with the clinical management, right? Because I think 
um, the, the benefit of ultrasound not only is in making the diagnosis, right? You can oftentimes narrow a differential faster, which get us kind of get us down the right track faster or a little, with a little more specificity. But the other benefit of ultrasound is that it can help guide our management, right? Um, so let's let's talk a little bit on the management side, um, you know, before we kind of wrap things up here. And I know we're going over uh, our time limit. If you guys have to hop off, that's fine. Um, but I, I'm going to keep going here until either I'm the only one left or we run out of material, um, which i got about another little bit of material here. Um, but basically, um, you know, once we've made the diagnosis or suspect this, um, how should we treat it? Um, Ashish, can you just walk us through just the overview of kind of what the treatment for, for myocarditis? So there are no good treatments for myocarditis, okay? <clears throat> so <laughs> I think it's that's the short answer, okay? I'm just going to make it very simple. So in acute idiopathic myocarditis, which is which we were talking about at the very beginning, patients who have had a viral syndrome who develop regions of subepicardial hyperenhancement and MRI, the the, diagno the management is, is based on symptoms. If you have a lot of arrhythmias, uh, you start them on beta blockers, you titrate them until the patient stabilizes. In about three months or so following the initial initiation of these guideline-directed medical treatments, such as ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, if the EF is still low and really low, then you start thinking about defibrillator placement and all that kind of stuff. A lot of times after three months, the degree of ventricular instability improves because the myocarditis has had a chance to heal itself, and then it becomes less of a problem. In the past, people have used corticosteroids, um, and people have used intravenous immunoglobulin and all kinds of treatments for patients with viral myocarditis, and none of those agents turned out to be useful. People have also used immunosuppressant agents like azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and you know things of that nature, which turn out to be not useful. So, in in most patients, you will you know there is no real benefit for treatment with um, with these agents. However, giant cell myocarditis is an exception. You know where you can use intravenous immunoglobulin. It's actually been shown to be the earlier you start the treatment. Uh, the more likely the patient is to make it. Um, and then, obviously, uh, if the patient doesn't respond, then the treatment uh, for um, giant cell myocarditis is ventricular cyst devices and um, cardiac transplant after waiting for a little while. So those those are the real treatments for uh, these patients. Um, as far as COVID is concerned, I don't think anyone really knows how to treat these patients because it, as it turns out, what I'm reading is that once really bad myocarditis develops, most of these patients don't survive, unfortunately. Even with IL-6 um, therapies and, you know, the remdesivir, you know, as you guys may have seen today, Gilead stock actually dropped because I think the studies are not turning out to be as great as they thought. So there's all kinds of stuff going on, um, but, you know, it, it, it seems like there's no real treatment at this time. So, so I think you answered my question, but I'm just going to ask it to get it on the record here. You know, obviously we're going to do, you know, support these patients, you know, with, with pressure support or fluid resuscitation as necessary. Um, but as for steroids, um, you know, they've been written about in some of the literature. I think there's, I'm just trying to find in my stack of articles here, but I think one of the case reports out of China was talking about giving steroids as part of the, the treatment yeah. regime. Um, yeah. but, but there's also conflicting reports in COVID patients that they don't really tolerate steroids terribly well. Um, and again, like I said, I think you've answered the question, but for the record, is there a role for uh, for steroids um, in, in these COVID patients with myocarditis? I don't think so. Again, I don't have a lot of experience of my own, but the literature that I've reviewed does not seem to suggest a benefit in these patients, unfortunately. I don't think anything is really working and from the cardiac perspective. And as I said, by the time you develop a severe myocarditis, I think other things have gone terribly wrong with these individuals. And, you know, it's it's like... Oh, I don't think anything really helps, quite frankly. It's very, very unfortunate. So with that being said, let's move on to kind of this, um, you know, basically vo volemic and, and pressure support, right, or blood pressure support. Um, you know, I've been reading also in COVID patients, they don't really tolerate hypervolemia terribly well, um, and, and that we should keep these patients as euvolemic as possible or even maybe, um, you know, keep them a little dry. Um, Z, I'm going to throw this over to you. Um, if a patient, you know, the patient that we presented at the beginning, right? They're going to end up in your unit because their their pressure stinks. Um, you know, is not going to be suitable for for being on the floor. Um, if they were admitted to you with a soft blood pressure set in the 70s or in the 80s, um, 
how are you going to address that? Um, you know, it, what's the, basically what's the role for fluids? When are you going to put on pressors? Kind of how are you going to make that determination? Um, so yeah, you're right. I mean, if if the patient comes in with with a hypotension and and they have um, low perfusion states, then we have to optimize perfusion because if the patient is hypovolemic then I'd rather fix the volemia first, the hypovolemia first. But in that case, I don't know that the patient has myocarditis and their contractility is bad. I'm going to give them fluids and see how they respond. Or if I'm worried because their hypoxia is, is, is uh, pretty bad and I don't want to overload the lungs, then I'm probably going to do the passive leg raising and see what happens to their blood pressure and to their heart rate and to the, con and to the cardiac filling with point-of-care ultrasounds. The ARDSnet studies suggest that pushing people to a CVP of four, which is really low and uncomfortable for most of us, um, although it, it, it results in a higher creatinine, it doesn't increase the risk for dialysis and it doesn't worsen outcomes. So it's kind of a safe haven for us to say, um, drop the or have the patient not don't overload the patient who's not in septic shock but really in ARDS from viral pneumonia or something like that. Um, and let's uh, let let's just make sure that the the heart is not empty. Uh, so because the wall might be a little bit thick, there might be some contractility problem, diastolic dysfunction. I'm probably going to try to give them. Um, to give them the, uh, to, to do the passive leg raising. Now, the thing that I want that I want people to avoid doing is to give those patients really small boluses that doesn't result in a clinical meaning, clinically detectable outcome. So, if you give a patient like this at 250 cc's over over uh, half an hour, uh, you, you're not going to create if, if enough of a physiologic change that you will see it on the blood pressure or the heart rate or the, or the lactate. If you want to do it, do it either really fast, half a liter in, in five minutes, so that you can see the effect, or uh, do a, a reversible bolus with the passive leg raising, which really, really helps. And w when you determine that you're, you're volume loaded enough and you, you still need some support, what press are you you're reaching for? I mean, there, there has been there has been really a, the, the large clinical trial that looked at uh, dopamine versus uh, levofed or norepinephrine in undifferentiated shock. And the answer is uh, levofed was successful 96% of the time and dopamine was successful around, I think, 75 or 8 or something like that percent of the time. Um, so really, levofed is our to-go agent uh, in undifferentiated shock. Meaning, I don't know if it's cardiogenic or vasodilatory or, or anything else. So, Ashish, if, if we're thinking about basically fulminant myocarditis and we need presser support, um, yeah. do you think, or is there literature that would kind of push us? I know the cardiologists like dobutamine, um, you know, for, for presser support, and then obviously the ED and the, the units, we always like levofed. Do you see any, um, any signal in all the noise uh, in the literature of kind of which one would be better, or is there... Um, you know, I guess the other question in my mind is, you know, with dimutamine probably having a slightly increased arrhythmogenic risk and the patient's already arrhythmogenically inclined with myocarditis, is there a concern in that capacity or does it not matter? Or kind of, how would you kind of approach that question? That's a very good question. So I think the, uh, the concern clearly is related to ventricular tachyarrhythmias, right? So in this population, um, you're, if you administer them dopamine, which is a good vasopressor, uh, you're certainly increasing the risk of arrhythmia. Um, so norepinephrine would be my drug of choice because the risk of tachyarrhythmia, uh, tachyarrhythmia from the ventricles is significantly lower, with is lower. I wouldn't say significantly lower, uh, with norepinephrine as compared with dopamine. Um, dobutamine, on the other hand, actually will is more likely to cause a drop in blood pressure because it's a vasodilator. So it doesn't increase your cardiac output because it improves ventricular left ventricular contractility, but it reduces blood pressure because it causes more vasodilatation than the other agents. So, so dobutamine, if you use it in combination with a second agent, so, such as norepinephrine, is frequently not a terrible idea in those who have severe peripheral vascular disease in whom you're trying to avoid limb gangrene and, 
things of that nature, but by itself, dobutamine may actually be detrimental. So if you're talking about just the vasopressor needs, um, I would prefer to go with norepinephrine in these patients. Um, the one thing to remember is that if you have a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension who's in a state of shock, you know, vasopressin needs to be considered because vasopressin actually is a good pulmonary vasodilator, um, and it's a systemic vasoconstrictor. So you can reduce the PVR and increase the peripheral vascular resistance, uh, which is the SVR, uh, if you use uh, with using uh, vasopressin. So again, in patients with significant pulmonary hypertension, keep vasopressin in mind, unless you have a patient with severe coronary artery disease where coronary vasospasm is a significant concern. Very good. And um, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of jump here um, to the last last item that I have on kind of in my notes here. But um, so far, we've been talking about the LV dysfunctions um, that arise from my myocarditis. Um, one of the features that that portends a worsening prognosis, right? That I've been re that I've read about um, in my acute myocarditis is biventricular failure. In fact, the New England Journal had a good article from 2009, kind of talking about this topic in general, and that was one of the things they mentioned that um, you know loss of RV function is a powerful predictor of death and need for transplantation. So, really briefly, um, you know, how should we be measuring Ashish um, RV function? I know Z mentioned it a little bit earlier, but kind of how do you approach RV function measurement? Yeah, so RV function is one of the most difficult things in echocardiography. Okay, that's it's that simple. So if you're if you're going to do simple TAPSI, it can be very misleading. So we see patients with uh, now this is a patient with a pretty big RV that is dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. You know, even though the frame rate is poor, I feel like this may be PE again. It's hard to say. This actually but was the not. Question it was that, underlying pulmonary hypertension. This, this okay, particular yeah. case. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it could be anything. That's why you cannot make a diagnosis just based on one image. The question is. What does TAPSI do? TAPSI is just telling you how much the annulus moves with every uh, with movement of the heart. And the TAPSI is frequently affected by left ventricular function. Okay, so the left ventricle is pulling the heart up and translating the heart in a certain direction, then TAPSI could be pretty normal. And we see this in patients with PE all the time. So the things that we depend upon also, in addition to TAPSI, if the, if the ventricle looks completely normal, then I just report a TAPSI, okay? Because I know TAPSI is going to be normal in a normal RV. But the and it's TAPSI is prognostic. It's a very helpful thing in a large population-based study. But in an individual patient, the thing that we use most commonly is fractional area change. So if you get a good apical four chamber view, and getting a good apical four chamber view where the RV is not actually cut off, the RV is actually being shown in its full extent with the full length of the septal leaflet and full length of the lateral leaflet, you should be able to get a fractional area change. So you measure the end diastolic area in the right ventricle, and you measure the end systolic area of the right ventricle, and if your change is more than 35%, your RV function is probably okay. But the images have to be high quality, okay? So you, you know, there's the usual four-chamber view, and then there's the RV-dedicated four-chamber view, and there's so many different types of four-chamber views that are used in full uh, cardiac studies, and we do those routinely in our patients. But again, one has to be careful that you're doing it properly. The, the other thing that you have, to, that I would not recommend uh, being done as part of point-of-care ultrasound is the myocardial performance index, which is diastology. It's based upon tissue Doppler of the right ventricle. The one thing that you can use in the emergency room sort of easily is the subcostal view, okay? So the subcostal view is very easy to get. As, as all of you know, uh, in, in the emergency room, all you got to do is put the probe in, this, in the hypogastric region, and then you can start seeing the heart. The right ventricle can be visualized very well some, uh, in patients who have bad lungs, who have a pneumothorax, and who have a, you know, pathol or who have chest tubes, and, you know, things like that. You can uh, put the probe there and you can start seeing the right ventricle quite well. But the wall of the right ventricle that you see on the subcostal view is the inferior wall. And on the apical four-chamber view, you're seeing the lateral wall of the right ventricle. So you're seeing different parts of the RV. But if your right ventricle appears to be normal size and function, and again, it, has, does, it should not be a foreshortened view or a laterally tilted view, uh, and the function of the RV appears good on the subcostal view, that is also helpful. So it's always a constellation of findings. It's never one thing. 
Okay, one more thing before you, uh, you know, before we stop. If you look at the parasternal view, okay, you can measure the right ventricular size in the parasternal long axis view provided the patient does not have bad lung disease and your window is not too low. Okay, so if your parasternal view is very low, close to the hypo, close to the epigastrum, the xiphoid process, then the RV can appear artificially dilated. Now you're closer to the RV than the LV. But if your parasternal view is being obtained in the normal fourth space or the third space, that, and if the RV appears dilated in that view, you can actually make a pretty good estimate that the RV is going to be bad in the other views also. And in the short axis view right above the aortic valve, the distance, the, you know, the, the, right, the right, right ventricular dimension in that view is also very helpful to determine the true right ventricular size and function. Very good. So we're about... 15 minutes over our time. Um, but I, I think this has been a great discussion. Thank you guys for, for participating. Uh, just as a little bit of a, a summary and a re recap. Z, can you, um, uh, can you kind of wrap up here? Uh, just kind of what are your big takeaways from, from today? And, and how can today's conversation help, you know, your fellows, my residents, um, you know, all of our learners, um, you know, go to the bedside tomorrow or later today, if you have a shift today, uh, and, and utilize these principles for our patients. Are you asking well, I, me, um, Matt? Uh, Z, Z, yeah. Z. Mm -hmm. So um, my biggest take, take home here is that acute myocarditis can happen early. It, it might not, it, if, if the patient comes in with myocardial dysfunction and ARDS, then I'm probably going to start asking questions and get help from cardiology and trying to figure it out. If the, if the end result is that the patient needs an MRI and the patient is not stable to go, then I'm still going to be managing the patient in a similar way to what I usually do, except uh, I'm going to probably watch out for arrhythmias. Gotcha. And Ashish, is there, I know we've covered a lot, but is there any kind of overview, wrap-up kind of thoughts that you have um, for us as we, as we approach these patients? So one of the most important things to remember is, is to know what you don't know. And <laughs> I, I, I think that's very, very difficult as we all are well aware, um, the issue is let's not try to overdiagnose things, okay? Let's be very, very careful uh, with how uh, you make a diagnosis. You know, I, I think user experience is extremely important, right? And then technology, every technology has limitations, and I think we've got to be very well aware of those limitations and, uh, you know, just use it carefully and, and in the best possible fashion and if you feel like things are not fitting, um, go to the next step <clears throat> and, you know, go to the gold standard test if you can. If you cannot, then, you know, I think clinical signs are often very, very helpful. So, like in your patient, the presentation with tachycardia and the hypotension is very suggestive of cardiogenic shock. So, I think those are the things that are clue you into thinking about, uh, you know, what may be happening and then the echo certainly supports that. If the echo in your patient, uh, you know, looked absolutely normal and your findings were with the blood pressure of 85 systolic and a heart rate of 117, then you're wondering what is going on. And it's like, okay, is the patient hypovolemic? Is the patient in uh, distributive shock and things like that? So I think things have to fit. And then in the, one of the cardinal principles in echocardiography, which you should try to remember again, very difficult, um, and even people have, that have been doing this for quite some time make a lot of mistakes about this, is that confirm your findings in an orthogonal view because one view is frequently, can be can often be misleading. So if you can get an orthogonal view and confirm your finding, that's often very helpful. Very good. Well, thank you guys for both being a part of this conversation. I found it inordinately helpful, um, even as, you know, with all the, the preparation that I've done, there's some, some takeaways that I had as well. So um, I guess before we, we sign off, um, if there's anybody still left that has questions, um, you know, for, for Ashish or for Z, um, I got, you know, we'll just open up for some questions and then um, and we can kind of call it a day after that. So anybody out there with questions? <laughs>